Might as well who, be... who likes toys? Yeah. Yeah. Who likes 80s toys? Yeah. Take it away. All right. Who, who spent way too much money on 80s toys? Yeah. All right. All right. Everybody, thank you so much for coming to our panel. We can't thank you enough. This is really exciting for us. It's our first Dragon Con as presenters, but we run a web channel called Retro Blasting. Uh, I know that there are a few people in the room who came to support us and know us. Thank you so much. We've been in this since 2012, and we do uh, videos that are fully scripted and edited, deconstructing movies, cartoons, and toys of the 1980s, which for all of us Gen Xers and, and early Gen Yers here is the greatest decade ever. Um, what we're going to do today, first let me introduce myself. My name is Michael French, and I'm Melinda Mock. And I'm Joe Demons. And we are the Retro Blasting team. Uh, what we're going to do today is kind of run you through certain things about the 1980s toys that uh, you may or may not have known. And even if you know them, maybe you've temporarily forgotten them and you'll get a chuckle out of them. But if any of you in here are the boyfriend, girlfriend, or partner of someone who dragged you in here, I assure you, you will not be bored. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah, let's we're, get... we're going to keep it moving, too. So we got a lot of stuff to go through. Get oh, closer to the mic. and how many, how many, how many, uh, we have a few kids in the audience, now. don't we? What? Yeah. Okay, good. This is a PG rated panel. There's not going to be any profanity. Um, and, uh, okay, maybe a little bit. Uh, but, I, but, I, but I will tell you that uh, even though all the toys that we have uh, in the slideshow were things you could buy at Toys R Us, there are going to be some images that speak for themselves of toys. So just let you know right now. All right, here we go. Okay, first I kind of wanted to go through who we are. Michael kind of already covered this, but we love all things sci-fi and, and 80s and retro. And so, you know, we, we've done cosplay here at Dragon Con. You recognize the carpet. Um, we play with toys, but mostly we restore toys and collect toys. Um, we've, I, I do personally, I collect My Little Ponies. Michael's got a wide variety of things um, from Star Wars to G.I. Joe to Transformers to all sorts of stuff. And uh, like I said, we do restorations. Um, we include our pets um, in those restorations. I'm just kidding. Um, and <laughs> Kirby is always welcome. He is always welcome. So um, basically, that sort of is why we are talking about this with you today. So does anybody have any idea why all of a sudden in the 80s, after the 60s, 70s, we get this huge influx of toys and cartoons and stuff like that? We got a couple people. Uh, you had a, a big thing where the cartoon and the toy make, or the cartoon companies and the toy makers were teaming up to sell a cartoon. They had to make the toys, and yep. both companies benefited from the. So, do you know why they never did that before? Anyone? Okay. So you're going to learn today. Um, basically, it's because of this. And in 1983, which you'll probably remember is when everything really started taking off. There was the Action for Children's Television, which had been around since the 60s, the late 60s. And it was like a, a, a group that was focused on protecting um, children from being advertised to and, and exploitation by, by marketers who were trying to market their toys through the cartoon. So they went after Romper Room back in the early 70s, um, who were marketing toys based on, they, they were called Romper Room Toys. And they were advertising them on the Romper Room show. And so this action group basically went in and said, if you guys don't stop doing that, we're going to go to the FCC and get you taken off the air. So they were successful. And so they eventually ended up having about 20,000 people in their political action group. And in the 80s, as you'll remember, Ronald Reagan came in. And he named, <laughs> he, he named this gentleman here um, the FCC chair. And, and so he basically said, no, we're, we're deregulating all of this. And so we're just going to let the open market decide. And so that's really why all of these things around 1983 just started exploding out from there. So that's important to remember why all of that stuff happened. The other thing that happened um, in the late 70s as we were going into the 80s is that we had these, uh, these Battlestar Galactica toys that um, really injured one kid and nearly killed no, no, or, or no. did, did kill another kid. Yeah. Um, the the uh, the Battlestar Galactica debacle of 1978 uh, that Christmas was bad. They had three toys. They had the Cylon Raider. They had the Battlestar Galactica fighter uh, Viper fighter, and they had uh, this other toy that this child is holding in the lower photograph. It's sort of a it was high, terrible. I had it. yeah, it's a hybrid <laughs> rocket thing. All of them had spring-loaded projectile missiles that would fire out uh, from the front uh, nose cones. Well, two children 
somehow decided to turn those on themselves. And unfortunately, one child died, uh, and the other child had to have intensive surgery uh, to remove the rocket. That's, that's this child here, Tom Rosinski. Uh, and, and after that, unfortunately, one of the children, the, ch the child that died was from Georgia. Just there's your, there's your downer trivia for this panel. We're now going up from here. Um, so uh, what happened was there was a backlash, uh, and they wanted more safety in their toys. So, yeah, and so you'll note that a lot of stuff in the 80s, there's a lot of like safety type of things within the toys. So um, that's that's actually what led to, but did you have a question? Um, kind of a morbid question actually. When you said he had to have his rocket removed, <laughs> where? Um, it, was, it went down his windpipe. And so they did a, it, it, he had it in his mouth. And, and there's a mechanism that if you move your finger near it, it fires. And so it shot right into his windpipe. And the size of that thing is like the perfect size for a child's epiglottis, so it basically just lodged in there. So he, um, the the child that died, I think, had the same exact issue with so a different okay. toy. Yeah, and you'll no and you'll notice on the box for the Cylon Raider. Do you see the large red circular sticker? Mm -hmm. That's actually the uh, warning to parents saying, "Don't worry, we have this is the toy that has been changed. It no longer allows the missiles to launch from the ship." Uh, so they found a way to keep selling the vehicles. But as any collector out there might be interested to know. If you want the original, you better ask the eBay seller because some of them, when you hit the button, the missile just kind of goes boink and then just sticks out of the ship, whereas the originals, the missile goes across the living room. So Or down your throat. Or yeah. down your throat. <laughs> yes? Uh, is it possible to pop it open and stick spring in? Yeah, well, the spring is still in there, so it's oh. possible to actually modify the missile oh, and okay. then make it fire. Yeah. Unlocked. Yeah, it's, I, I probably shouldn't have said Feel that. Perfect. All right. <laughs> yes. All right. Unlike our next toy, which is, as I'm sure all of you are familiar with, ro uh, rocket firing Boba Fett. He was the yeah. first. Yeah, he was the first victim uh, of this safety backlash. So he was in development uh, when the Battlestar Galactica incident went down, because he was going to come out in '79, and he was going to have a rocket firing backpack, uh, much like uh, Django. They finally showed Django doing it in Attack of the Clones, um, and they had to say, nope, sorry, we can't do that, but all the kids had already sent away for it. So they sent this note of apology on Star Wars letterhead to the kids in the mailer saying, we're really sorry that we can't have a, a rocket firing Boba Fett. We've just glued it in his backpack, which is what we all played with as kids. If you are dissatisfied, let us know and we will send you any Kenner uh, Star Wars action figure of your choice. So I don't know how many kids actually took them up on that offer because Boba Fett was still pretty cool. So. Yeah. And then this was, this was another big one. So, so Voltron, um, Voltron was originally uh, from a 1981 Japanese anime called Beast King Go Lion. And they sold the die cast metal toys in stores in Japan. And what a lot of people don't realize is that the original Go Lion toy was loaded to bear with, an, with arsenals of weapons, missiles, launchers, swords, shields, everything. I mean, what happens at the end of every Voltron episode? Four blazing sword. Four blazing sword. He opens up the sword, he kills the row beast, everybody's happy, somebody laughs awkwardly out of sync with their mouth. Um, and, and what ended up happening was they were so paranoid about the Battlestar Galactica incident that they stripped the Go Lion toy of everything that could shoot, everything that was pointy. They even, they even dulled the teeth on the lions. So when you get a matchbox die cast Voltron, you get no sword, you get no shield. You get no missiles, you get no launchers, and you get dull teeth. Um, so you can always tell a, uh, a uh, Japanese one from, from the American import. When did they actually sell the sword? Because I have the one with the sword. All right, was that the one with the action figures in it? Uh, no, it was. OK, because what ended up happening was they, they, they realized that, hey, you know, every episode ends with the sword. We kind of need to have the sword. And so they sold the sword later separately on a card back. So you could buy the sword and shield for your Voltron separately on a card back. But they never sold the, the missiles and the launchers. They said, no, we're never bringing those over. And we have this Japanese Go Lion. And I can tell you, those missiles will go. Yeah, and they, they go fast. They're, it's like, chow! And, and you're like, where'd it go? I hope the cat doesn't get it. Like, I, <laughs> so. It's going to be Battlestar Galactica all over again. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. The, as if that wasn't bad enough, Voltron had a second hit against it with the uh, the lead paint. Um, so there was there were specific models of the toy that were found to have lead paint in them, and so they got recalled. Yeah, because the the 
the originals were sold in Japan. So if you flip them over, they say made by uh, bo uh, made they by Pope. That. No, no, that's the that's the Taiwan. Oh, right. The one that says made in Japan, you, it says GB thirty six. Well, they got so popular because we were all buying them that they said we got to make more. Outsource it to another factory in Taiwan. Well, when they did that, the lead paint got into the system. So if you have ones with those stickers on the bottom that say Bandai made in Taiwan, you've probably got one filled with lead. Good luck with that. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about some weird features to some of our favorite toys. And um, well, I, just feel free to chime in if you've had this experience. So <laughs> go ahead, Joe. Well, you know, when you buy a, a playset and an accessory, you, you would hope that they would all work together properly. Um, you'd be able to play with them much like you see them used in the cartoon or the movie. Um, however, when you when you take the Ecto-1 and you try to park it within the firehouse, uh, you run into a couple of issues. Um, you either have to back it out the rear of the firehouse or you have to extend it through the front doors and then you have a very, uh, you know, open firehouse and as Egon would say, uh, in a demilitarized zone, probably not the best option for your, uh, for your toys. So, um, you know, there were just details that weren't quite planned out uh, as thoroughly as they could have been with the toys. Raise your hand if you had the, the play the play set. How did you manage to, were you able to use the little spinning fire pole <laughs> successfully? No, yeah, it doesn't work very well, and you have to perfectly balance the right characters so that the weight distribution allows it to spin down, but really they can only go down. They can't go back up, which, I mean, you know, obviously makes sense, but it's a real pill to, like, wind that thing back up again, right? Yeah. And then every half flight it would stop, and you'd have to touch it and nudge it and bump it and get it to go again. Did you have a problem with the slime that came with it? Oh, uh, yeah, the slime. The slime that they said was washable, but every no matter how many washes you did on an action figure, there were still dried bits of it stuck in all the little crevices. Yeah, the slime was horrible. But it, you know what? If you open a can of it now, it's still good. Yeah. If you go on the Retro Blasting video channel, we open one up after 30 years, and it's still good. Well, good. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. good. Okay, it's still slimy. It's still in its original state. Right. So, so here's one that, that uh, was always a disconnect because uh, we're going to get into Masters of the Universe only briefly to, as far as the toy line is concerned. Um, but, uh, you know, on, on He-Man, Man-at-Arms had a mustache because mustaches were in. Magnum P.I., you know, everything was in. Um, lots of guys had mustaches. Yeah. Uh, there, were, there were lots it of mustaches. It was super awesome, particularly Magnum P.I. Just watch it all day. There were, there were some mustachioed action figures that were very dapper, and we always wondered why Man at Arms was not given the same privilege, given his uh, mustache in the, uh, the show. Mustache. Yeah, but it's because of the fact that he was actually developed as part of a series of mini-comics with the toy line before there was ever a cartoon in development, because Masters of the Universe came out before the deregulation of children's television. So they had to find other ways to promote those toys, and so the designs were not locked down. And then when Filmation finally got permission in 1983, to make an animated series, they thought, we need to differentiate Man at Arms. Let's give him a cool Tom Selleck mustache. <laughs> yeah, and on, in that same vein, um, how many people here knew that Tila was a clone? Anybody? Two people? Three people? Mm -hmm. So, in, again, talking about the mini comics that came out before the cartoon, but at the same time as the toys had originally come out, Tila was developed as... Um, well, let's see. Her mother was the sorceress, who was called the goddess, and Skeletor did this awesome thing where he impregnated her with this magical artifact, sure. and w but she was a clone. She was like she she was a clone. She wasn't an actual baby. So she was supposed to be the sorceress or the goddess, um, and then he was going to take her and raise her as an evil version of the goddess, so that he would have someone in his pantheon that could contend with her, right? And so, but, but what's really weird about all of that, as though that weren't <laughs> weird enough, is that this over here is from the mini comic, and this is the goddess, or the sorceress. And if you'll notice, she's the reason why, I always wondered this as a kid, why does Tila have this weird snake head when she's never wearing that in the cartoon? Where does that come from? So it comes from this, and then because they basically modeled Tila after both the, the blonde Tila here and the sorceress, um, they had to make up this whole bird motif for the actual sorceress in the cartoon. 
So is, is that thoroughly confusing for everyone? <laughs> <laughs> Who remembers this scene? Who knows the movie? Okay. Yeah. Did Go you ahead. know that they made a toy based on this guy so that he could stab your action figures? Yeah. <laughs> this is wild. So so the, the character, of course, his name is Chosen, and he was the guy that, you know, gave made life difficult for Daniel son in Okinawa. Uh, and uh, they decided, Remco decided in 1985 or 86 when they made this action figure, that he would have a forearm twisting action where his shiv would come out so that he could dirk Daniel son <laughs> The, the only awesome. problem with this, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, is that they never made Daniel's girlfriend into an action figure. So we couldn't recreate it exactly, thank God. <laughs> Yes. If I could interject briefly, uh, what well, you just touched on, I've, I've often wondered, as somebody who was playing with these as they came out, why were there such glaring omissions in terms of the, the, the set of figures so that you could not act out what was happening in the movies? Yeah, it just all depended on what their budget was and what, what these toy companies decided to do at the time. Um, there were very few comprehensive toy lines. A lot of them had glaring omissions, and as a matter of fact, we're going to get into a small facet of that later on in, in the presentation. W one of the weird things is um, with the deregulation, see, we keep coming back to that, So, um, but one of those things that came with that is that you've got toy companies and production companies both telling the designers of all of these things what needs to happen and just like today those people aren't necessarily in touch with their audience so it's like these corporate executive types who are like yeah I think we need to have this character and this character and the, the creators are saying that's not really the, the best plan but you know the, the people in charge are the people in charge so I think that probably is a big reason why we get what we get Oh, yeah. So who loves Robotech? All right. Well, Robotech, as you know, was three different series. There was Macross, Moss Peta, and um, um, uh, oh, the one no one remembers, Southern Cross. Uh, when we got to the third series, which was called New Generation, but it was the Moss Peta Japanese show, uh, the whole gimmick behind it was that you had uh, a suit that would turn into a motorcycle ar uh, around you, and then you would be the rider of the motorcycle. But then it would wrap back around you to become a mecha suit to defend yourself against large robotic enemies. Well, unfortunately, <coughs> Matchbox uh, made a very clunky, fragile line of toys for the entire Robotech line, which is a panel in and of itself, so we can't go into all of it. But one of the little quirky things about the, uh, the Moss Peta-inspired uh, motorcycle is that the action figure of Scott Bernard is, is actually wearing almost half of the motorcycle already. So uh, he has a hard time riding it because he's already wearing it. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so your favorite part of playing with Star Wars toys was having lightsaber battles. Um, I know mine was. So um, the problem with that is that only five figures had lightsabers. So uh, if, you, if you lost a lightsaber, you were having to beg your mom to get you a new Luke or a new you know, Obi-Wan or whatever so that you could have another lightsaber because they would fall down in the, the heating ducts and, you know, somewhere. You know, cat your cat would eat them, yeah. your sister would eat it, you know, whatever. Yeah, and, and imagine you've got <laughs> Terminator back there. You, you, you've, got, you've got 96 action figures from Kenner for Star Wars. 96. Only five come with lightsabers. Whereas now, you've got 96 action figures that come with lightsabers and two that don't. And they're probably droids. Um, <laughs> but if you needed a droid, with a, there, there was a, a missing sixth one. And that's, that's little R2 here. So, I mean, it's kind of a weird shaped little, it's kind of got a, a saber feel to it because it's being stuffed down inside, but, but you know, you could use it in a pinch. It's, it's more like a whiffle saber. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the auxiliary. The lightsabers from the early figures, I lost them all the time. Right. And I remember going to the grocery store one time with my mom, and I saw colored toothpicks on the shelf. Of <laughs> oh, yeah. Nice. Said, I want that. And so those replaced my lightsabers from then on out. Had I been as industrious as you, my childhood would have been less traumatic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, those colored toothpicks were perfect. What's up? Would any of y'all happen to know, how did they end up with a yellow saber on Luke? Huh. Hey, look at that. <laughs> we're talking about that. Huh. Yeah. Thank you for the nice segue. Yeah, thank you for the segue. Uh, so the, the oddest accessory thing about the Kenner series is that Luke was given a yellow lightsaber uh, even though it was blue in the films. And the early uh, merchandising campaigns, as you can see from the top right, 
all the lightsabers were depicted as, as yellow if you were the good guy. I mean, for, for all the way through the Empire Strikes Back line. And then when they finally got to Return of the Jedi, they screwed it up again. If you back up one slide, you'll see that Luke Skywalker in the top right, the Jedi Luke, has a blue lightsaber laying next to him. Mm -hmm. And finally, somebody said, you know, we probably should get this right. And so they quickly corrected it. And so Return of the, the, the Jedi Luke Skywalker, you can find him with a blue saber or a green one. Whereas with the Empire Luke and the Farm Boy Luke, you can only find them with yellow. Which one's harder to find? Uh, for the Jedi Luke, the blue one is harder to find. Um, for the others, of course, it's all yellow. So. Yeah, we have a full deconstruction of this on our channel. If you're interested in that whole yellow lightsaber thing, it's kind of a mystery. I think the biggest the closest answer that we have to that is that you know they were making they were using production stills uh, over in the the orient when they were you know making all these toys and they they may not have had a very blue hue to them because you know during production they just used sticks so they weren't colored they did that in post production right and the funny <laughs> thing is that the obi-wan down there has a blue one but then they had 12 inch dolls they were like barbie sized dolls of the characters for the first few years and on those, Obi-Wan's is yellow and Luke's is blue. But on the box for Obi-Wan on the card, on the action figure, the small one, he's holding a yellow lightsaber. But on the box for the doll, I think he's holding a, ye a yellow lightsaber in a completely different photograph. It's really weird. It, like, the whole thing is messed up. You had a question? Yeah, um, I could have sworn I remembered, like, when I was a kid, having a, a more life-sized lightsaber that was, like, yellow that you could use to bruise your friends and stuff Yes. Like the the, yeah. the, the was telescoping? It, was it that? No, no, no. That's yeah, the okay. inflatable. The, oh, the next the one was the Force lightsaber and started with the Empire line. It was a hard plastic tube, and yeah. when, it had a whistle yeah. on the top. Yes. And when you waved, it was like, woo. Uh, and, and that, the yellow one, is definitely more difficult to find. Yeah, the yellow one is the hardest one to find. So, because they switch it to green for Return of the Jedi. Yep. <laughs> now, the other one about this that we just had to bring up was the fact that um, by the time they got to Return of the Jedi, there was this sort of safety sentiment running down, and uh, they, they gave all the action figure sticks. There were very few blasters left at that point, even though everybody in the movie was shooting each other. So, Are you going to touch on the buy a box for Christmas. <laughs> that, that's a presentation unto itself. But yeah, there was a, they didn't have figures ready for the first Christmas in 78, so they had to like sell an empty box and promise you that you'd get four figures in the mail. It's called the early bird set. A lot of people didn't buy it at the time, so now it's worth a lot of money. So, we're, yeah, we're good. All right. All right, so by Return of the Jedi, you know, Star Wars was super popular, but it's a mystery to me why this playset, who had this playset? <laughs> everybody <laughs> it looks like a, a bunch of trees after a hurricane doesn't it <laughs> i mean it's really disappointing con compared to what's in the movie this big lush you know elven forest you know so but what's really interesting is if you're still a collector um what we what we talk about is that you know you can get this other playset that's essentially this playset, but it looks a lot better and that's the Robin Hood Prince of Thieves. I don't know. <laughs> all they did, all they did was Kenner had the license for Robin Hood. And so they said that he needs Sherwood Forest. Hey, we got the molds for the Ewok village. Let's give it some, let's give it some leaves and we'll put it back out in the market. And the funny part is, is that the Robin Hood Prince of Thieves figures are actually markedly taller than the Star Wars ones, but they didn't bother to scale the playset up. So the playset still works for at, Ewoks and uh, Luke Skywalker. At the time, work. Kenner was notorious for repurposing their toys. Um, if you look at the Robin Hood Prince of Thieves toys, they're all either uh, Star Wars bodies with re-sculpted heads or superpowers bodies with re-sculpted heads. So they just repainted everything and yeah. you know, put different accessories with it. And Friar Tuck is a Gamorrean guard. Yes. <laughs> and uh, uh, <laughs> Robin Hood is... Um, Green arrow. Green arrow. Green arrow. Yeah. That would be the best mashup. I think Steppenwolf ever. is another. <laughs> Next yeah. year, I'm just saying. Somebody back there had a question. Uh, I was going to say, Fire, Fire Tuck is a Gormian guard. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right, so some of these toy lines from the 80s had some, some interesting <coughs> origins. Um, for my pony people out there, my little pony started off, um, it was designed by this woman who worked um, for. Uh, Hasbro and her name was Bonnie Zacherly and she originally had this idea for an, a line of actual horses because she loved horses as a little girl and she wanted little girls to be able to brush their horse and she wanted them to be natural colors like just look like real horses and they were big so if you see down here you've got this big horse and then you've got what ended up being the little My Little Pony that we're all familiar with um, 
And so I guess at some point they took the design and they said, let's try it with some funky colors. So they made that horse pink and, and marketed that, but then they said, let's make it small. And you know, I think it'll be more marketable that way. So they they have the original butterscotch is marketed with this pony, and then you know you get your original line of what people think <laughs> is the first My Little Ponies. But it was originally My Pretty Pony. So um, that's just kind of a weird little backstory. Oh, Rambo! <laughs> Does anyone remember the, uh, the the automatic water gun craze of the '80s? <laughs> okay, that actually started with Rambo. And then Rambo was the first one to have the automatic water guns. And then when the Rambo license ran out, they just repackaged them as Intertech. And then after that, uh, there was the whole thing with kids getting shot by cops. And so they moved on to the Super Soaker. Uh, but yeah, Rambo actually didn't start as an action figure line or a cartoon, even though he had that. He was one of the first rated R movies to just say, hey, let's start selling guns to kids. It'll be awesome. <laughs> so. Yeah, he was, it was also the first rated R movie that was made into a cartoon. I know we're not talking cartoons, but I just love Rambo, so I just thought I'd throw that in there. All right. Yes. All right, yeah, Transformers. So how many people in here know kind of any of the, the history of the Transformers toy line and, and how it came to be in the States? You know, that um, Hasbro basically had a connection with Takara in Japan. They were the Japanese importers and distributors. Let's talk about that. In Japan, they had, come on, they had a Japanese company called Takara where they made Transformers, but there was no storyline and no name to them. Mm -hmm. So then Hasbro buys rights to them and gives them a name and a cartoon and all correct, names and correct. storylines. Give the kid a round of applause. Yeah, for real. Good job. Do the presentation. There we go. So I, you, you've just taken half my notes here. So, um, But no, like you said, um, uh, Hasbro had a connection with Takara. They were importing and distributing the G.I. Joes in Japan. Um, and so in 1983, uh, Hasbro goes over to the Tokyo Toy Show um, looking for new ideas uh, for what they could bring over to the States and import as, you know, bring in a new property. Um, so Takara had a couple of different lines. They had the Micro Change line and the Diaclones. Um, Unrelated toy lines, you know, very different functions, very different properties. And Hasbro was like, well, let's just take these, put them together. We'll create a backstory for all of the different toys, and we'll bring it in as one property in the States. Uh, the only thing that they had in common were, was that they, you know, they looked like one thing and changed and transformed into another. So Hasbro was like, well, let's call them the Transformers. Um, completely unrelated. Uh, the Diaclone line uh, was a bunch of vehicles that were all piloted. They were drones. They were not... Um, cognizant in their own right. And that's why they have all the first Transformers have these little cockpits. Right. But yeah, they, they, they originally had these little men that would go in them. Yeah. And you'll see those those go all the way through um, the Dinobot, uh, Dinobots and other toys like that. They all have cockpits but never came with any kind of a pilot. Um, and then the Micro Change line was um, originated to go with the, uh, the Microman line, which was an offshoot of what had originally been G.I. Joe in Japan. Um, <laughs> And it was just a bunch of everyday uh, objects, radios, um, mi um, microscopes. German um, pistols. German pistols, because everybody had those lying around. And um, Yeah, I, I love this. Uh, the back of this cassette man. It says, unimaginable. How can a headphone stereo become a robot? <laughs> it's like, that was sort of the, one of those cheap toys that your, your aunt or your grandma or somebody would get for you. This was before they became Transformers. So... So really just odd beginnings. They were completely unrelated. Um, no backstories for anything. And Hasbro basically created the backstory. Um, and it got so popular that Takara was like, well, hey, they're loving this in the States. We're just going to discontinue everything that we're producing here under the Diaclone line and the Micro Change line and just introduce it as Transformers here in Japan. So that's where it comes from. Yeah. Uh, you want to talk about the rub signs? Well, uh, the rub signs came into be because... Um, there got to be a big uh, boom in knocking off or, or creating cheap reproductions of some of the toys. They got to be so popular, everybody was like, let's, you know, let's jump in on this. And so Hasbro, in all of their wisdom, was like, well, we want you to be able to tell when you're getting an original Hasbro Transformer. So they introduced the rub signs for all of the toys. Yeah. And it was a, a big gimmick that, you know. Well, but it helped because the one on the bottom is Shockwave. He was a Transformer that turned into an electronic laser gun. But what they didn't realize when they licensed it was the company in Japan that had already made that toy had already licensed it to Radio Shack. Yep. 
So Radio Shack sold it as Galactic Man. So there was a reason, a real reason to have those rub sign stickers on there so that kids knew what was real. Didn't they also do that with Dinobots? I think so. Sure. Yep. Well, uh, Hasbro, in order to bolster the toy line, went to other manufacturers in Japan too and started pulling in different toys. That's uh, like Michael said. That's where the uh, the the Shack Wave or Shack uh, Wave is what Shock Wave came from. Um, we all know about Jetfire and the the Macross. We're getting there. And we will touch on that later. And then also uh, Omega Supreme came from a different toy line. So they were just grabbing whatever they could that seemed to fit in and just cobbled it all together. Okay. Now we're back to. Our favorite Voltron. <laughs> yeah, just a storied history. Um, there was a second Voltron very briefly on the shelf. They were called Voltron 1, 2, and 3. One was the vehicles, two was this guy called Gladiator, and three was the Lions. And uh, they were going to do three cartoons, but when the Lions became so popular and the vehicles were totally not popular as cartoons, they said, you know what, there's no way we're going to dub the third show, which was called Lightspeed Electroid All Vegas. And so they said, let's <laughs> ditch it. And so they ditched the show and they ditched the toy. And so this toy is actually one of the, the, the more prized Voltrons for hardcore collectors, because he wasn't on the shelves too terribly long. Yeah, I think that's the only reason. That's the only reason. <laughs> he's real fragile and gimmicky, and he's like a multi-armed humanoid guy. He's kind of dorky. Yeah. Excuse me. What, what vehicles are uh, proposed Voltron to? There are no vehicles. It's just three human robots, and they combine into one human robot. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even bigger robot. Right. <laughs> all right. So there were a lot of legal battles, and and as there still are, you know, with licensing and all that kind of stuff. So the first one we're going to talk about is Ghostbusters. I'm sure everybody's familiar. Um, so Ghostbusters didn't have a toy line initially right after the movie came out. But what, what you may not know is that originally there was a 70s TV show that was live action that was done by Filmation. And, um, Harry Storch. Yes, Harry Storch. Harry Storch. And so um, they originally, I don't know if you want to tell yeah, the story. They, what happened was they licensed the name to Columbia so Columbia could call their movie Ghostbusters. And then they got into kind of a, a legal quabble with them because Columbia had promised them 1% of the profits as part of the deal from the movie. Well, then Columbia came back and said, the movie just wasn't profitable. They did this thing called Hollywood accounting, <laughs> where the movie doesn't make any money so that they don't have to pay licensing fees. Um, they, so basically, Filmation walked away with 500000 and that's it for the use of their thing. And so later, after the movie was successful, they came back and said, well, we don't want to end up paying them again, like to get the rights again to, to make a cartoon for Ghostbusters. So they just decided to go their own way, and they made the real Ghostbusters, mm -hmm. right? Right. And so then they made toys based off of the cartoon that they did, which are you know markedly different in design from the guys in the movie. And so then as a you know to, for payback, Filmation said, well we're gonna that's our thing, so we're gonna make a cartoon at the same time. And so you have you know Filmation Ghostbusters with its own toy line and its own cartoon based on its original show that was competing at the same time with the, the real Ghostbusters. And what would often happen is the, the Filmation Ghostbusters would be on, on weekday afternoons when you'd get home. And then on Saturday, you'd get to see the real Ghostbusters. So you'd get home and you'd be like, I guess I'll watch the Ghostbusters with the ape. <laughs> and I gotta wait for Saturday. Ugh. The cartoon isn't really my cup of tea. It's, it's really geared toward a kind of younger audience. But I will say that playset, they, they had this huge playset. It was like a haunted house thing. It was, it was amazing. Yeah. So if you ever get if you ever get a chance to even look it up, it's it's super cool. It's a holy grail playset, and we don't have it. It usually goes for eight to nine hundred dollars on on eBay when you find it. It's amazing. Yeah. All right. Um, so so tell me who the guy is on the left. Conan. I am glad to hear people say Conan. Maddie Collector, um, Mattel, uh, said that, uh, no, this is Vicor, an early design for He-Man. Uh, but what really ended up happening was uh, Universal, in 1981, sued Mattel because they said they had been working on a Conan toy line for the uh, Schwarzenegger film and that Mattel had uh, started this He-Man thing and violated their copyright. And Mattel said, no, 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 we were already developing a sword and sorcery uh, uh, line. We, we weren't copying you guys. And they won the legal battle. Well, then all of a sudden, a 
few years ago, just like three years ago, two years ago, in their Maddie Collector Classics line, they release Vicor. And they're like, he's based on an early He-Man prototype. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so you had nothing to do with Conan at all. I think you're lying. Yeah. So. Oh, this is Joe's territory. <laughs> So now we come back to where uh, Hasbro was bringing in toys from other lines to you know, try to bolster the, the, the Transformers line here in the States. Um, well, they really loved the Valkyrie design from, that uh, Bandai was producing, or, um, or Takatoku was producing in Japan, and wanted to introduce this new character into the animation named Skyfire, Jetfire, you know, it's been named so many different things. Um, so they go over and they get the license only for the toy, uh, not for the... Um, the animated uh, character and so they bring the toy jet fire over into the states but they can't animate it uh, as the Valkyrie because that would be um, stepping on Bandai's toes with the uh, with the the Robotech toy so um, they had to completely drastically change the look of jet fire in order to introduce him into the cartoon um, yeah took a lot of imagination as a child <laughs> to you know have your jet fire toy and try to um, picture him as the, the, the lovable big jet that, that the Autobots had. Right, and there's even a note in the behind the scene. If you look at some of the uh, early scripts for Transformers, they have these like character sheets, and they have this type out that says, there's like a handwritten note with like four exclamation points that says, Skyfire, do not use to the, all the writers. It's like, we've gotten in a legal battle. Whoa. We're going to go with the mood lighting. <laughs> uh, we've gotten in a legal battle with, uh, with um, Harmony Gold, who's doing Robotech. <laughs> We can, we can sell the toy, but they have the, 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 that character in their show. The one on the left is in their show animated because Macross used the Valkyrie transforming robot. Mm -hmm. So we can only sell the toy as a transformer. We can't show him in the show. And then eventually Skyfire just disappeared even in that form. They're like, this isn't worth it. But there was one animated uh, clip, and that was in the commercial. In the commercial, right. right. And then intertwined in that whole battle was... Um, Matchbox wasn't allowed to do any transforming uh, Valkyries in the States because it would violate uh, Hasbro's um, copyright on the, the, the Valkyrie <laughs> toy line for Jetfire. Um, the early production uh, of Jetfire was still using a, a Macross base. If you look on the, uh, the left-hand side there, that is a Matsushiro Jetfire that still has the, uh, the Macross logo on the wings. Um, it does not have a... Um, Takara stamp or anything in it. It has a, uh, a copyright date of 1983 on it. So that is one of the earlier production toys um, still based off of the, the Robotech molds that they were producing the toys for in Japan. And this legal battle is still going on because at Comic-Con two years ago, they released a G.I. Joe Transformers mashup exclusive, which was a Sky Striker painted up to look like Jetfire. And they gave him the jet boosters on top and everything. And Harmony Gold came around and said, hey! <laughs> That's ours, remember? From the 80s? We sued you? Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so, did you guys know that the Dukes have two faces, at least as far as the toy company Mego is concerned? Mego. Do, you know, do you know why? Because of these two guys who were in the show very briefly when uh, Luke and Bo Duke were on a... Uh, uh, a deliberate hiatus to get better pay or better royalties. Uh, a lot of times what will end up happening is uh, the Koi and Vance ones got packaged in because that was at the height of Migo's license. And so sometimes they were mixed um, so, uh, on the cards. Sometimes they don't even say Koi and Vance. Even if they are, they say Bo and Luke, but it's really Koi and Vance. And you can tell by their really goofy expressions and head proportions. <laughs> um, but the Bo and Luke are actually on the left of those two photographs, and the Koi and Vance are on the right. There's a guy on eBay right now who's selling, I think it's 99 uh, Koi's, the, the blonde guy on the far right. He's selling 99 in a lot. It's been up there for like three years. Nobody <laughs> wants it. <laughs> so. Why would you need 99 of them? He's trying because to get rid of 100 is too many. Uh, 100 <laughs> is too many. Maybe he's going to make a coat. <laughs> <laughs> Just, that's his what pride. I'm saying. Okay. So that doesn't explain why we have this. We also have two faces for Daisy. Which uh, is also really weird. It's like, well, one of them doesn't look much like Catherine Bach, but at least she looks like, you know, normal. And then the other one looks like something from a 70s horror film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the electric 
Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, that would be actually pretty cool. Right. So going back to what we were talking about a minute ago with um, He-Man, anybody familiar with Wonder Bread He-Man? Yeah. It, you're like, wait, I, I sense we're losing the audience here. So um, there's, there's this thing that's been fl floating around for years. People say they, they had this special offer from Wonder Bread that you mail something in and you get this, this He-Man, this weird He-Man figure. And there's at least one person out in the world, according to the He-Man forums, that has in, in the baggie, the original like production baggie, this character that's on the left. And so it's this thing that's sort of talked about within the He-Man collectors groups. And so when they did the Masters collection recently with He-Man, they produced one dar. So they took the Wonder Bread He-Man thing. But see, the thing about all of this is no one has any recollection of any of this ever happening. Mattel, like, Mattel doesn't. Doesn't recognize it as an official Doesn't recognize figure. it. <laughs> Wonder Bread doesn't remember having done any kind of promotion like yeah. this. No one can show any sort of documentation that this was an actual mail away. So, you know, it's kind of up in the air as to whether these are all kind of fake and someone's just painting these because there aren't a ton of them out there. Or it's the Enron of 80s toys. They deleted yeah. all records. Yeah. Well, yeah. And there was, Shred everything. And, there were, and there's a reason, the theory, that there's a conspiracy theory that the reason that Mattel denies all knowledge of this and pulls an Oliver North is that, is that they think this might have been a later prototype of Conan. Mm -hmm. And the, re the way to get rid of them real quick was to just shuff them off through Wonder Bread. And then when people came back around, it's like, oh, we, we don't remember that promotion. I don't know what that's about. So. Deny everything. There was a promotion fairly early on in the toy run where if you bought four or five and you, you, you sent in uh, the little things on the back to Mattel, they would send you a free figure. Right. And the one that I got didn't have the, uh, the chest plate, but it was just basically He-Man with brown hair. And I never understood that. So you're one of the few. <laughs> that got that got this figure. Do you still have it? No. I'm so sorry. <laughs> he's 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 minty now. He's worth well, some money. Right. 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 Uh, you first. Well, and some of them that they say that didn't come with chest plate. They came with like the brown many weapon. Right. Right. Oh, yes. No, I was just gonna say I had one too without the chest plate, but I'm pretty sure my dog ate it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of them are shown with like these sort of red looking weapons. That like, was a rich meal. Yeah, yeah really seriously. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so everyone's probably familiar with this guy from G.I. Yeah, Joe. Yeah. Does anyone remember what this card says? Have you read it anytime recently? Uh, no. So basically it says Spirit comes from a family so far below the poverty line that they never realized they were poor. <laughs> I don't think this would go over too well today. Um, and he, it also says that um, he is a shaman, a medicine man. He's not a healer or a priest or a witch doctor. There isn't any equivalent in our culture for what he is, unless we had shrinks that could actually help people. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. It's just... <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> so in early attempts to be progressive, they still fell flat on their face. Yeah, I mean, G.I. Joe is really notorious for being super inclusive of a lot of races, genders. They have more females in their group than anybody else. But then, you know, the Native Americans always get the short end of the stick. So there you go. All right. Who... Who can tell me which one of these lovely ladies actually finally, at the very end of the run, had an action figure made out of her? RC? RC. <laughs> not originally. V vintage, not, not now, but originally. Exactly. Do you know? Ginny, I think. It's actually the brunette, because... Um, In the far, far left, far left, left corner. Far corner. Yeah, she, she's from Mask. Mask. Gloria Baker. Gloria Baker. Gloria Baker. Oh, I didn't know that. And um, I guess they had something against redheads, I don't know, but they, which pisses me off, but they, <laughs> they didn't make any of these other characters, you know, we've got, if you guys want to take them through, I... Yeah, go ahead, Joe. You and know. The, uh, the upper left is Crystal Kane from the Centurions. 
who was in every single episode of the show, yeah. uh, but never had an action figure produced. And then JB from Brave Star is the one middle top, and she was in every episode and didn't have an action figure. And then you have, uh, what's her name, uh, Nico from Galaxy Rangers. Uh, she didn't have an action figure. Uh, RC, RC never had a vintage, uh, vintage G1, 80s yeah. action figure, and then the one on the the lower right is the character Jenny from Bucky O'Hare. She almost had an action figure, but it's only available as a sales sample. Uh, so those are highly prized. Yeah, there was a there was a definite um, females aren't allowed in boys action figure lines. We want them in the show, but we don't really want them in the toy line, which is unfortunate because they were interesting characters. Maybe they didn't sell as well. Or, but that changed say, in the '90s. There was a distrust in the in the public that they would that the boys would purchase you know female action figures from their favorite shows. Yeah. Do you have? No, I'm not sure. I I collected mass toys myself. I don't think I ever saw Gloria. I thought it was Vanessa Warfield and Manta. Right. Vanessa Warfield was in Manta. You're correct. And then late, 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 late in the line, they made Gloria Baker and put her with a, a Lamborghini. Called, it was they didn't a, it was give a, her the awesome car from yeah. the yeah. show, yeah. which is a real shame. The car never got made. Yes, sir. If I remember right, they actually did a prototype of the shark. Yeah. Uh, well, th those are floating around, and some of them are actually fan-made. So it depends. No one's really gotten the story on that photo floating around. Is it a prototype or is it a really good fan-made shark? It was impressive in a particular y way. Yeah. Don't have RC. How do you make Chromia? That's your question, not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, I'm honestly not sure why. Uh, I would say that's probably the, one of the biggest glaring omissions from the 1986 toy line is they, they did all of the other new toys from the movie. Uh, except for RC, and she was probably one of the biggest characters in the film. All right. So it's it's unfortunate that it was never produced. All right. All right. So All now right. we're just going to go into straight out weird facts. <coughs> okay. <laughs> so we all know who these three lovely gentlemen are, uh, with their vacuous smiles and uh, and their their stalwart poses. These are the twelve inch dolls from Kenner from uh, the Star Wars line. Now. We're about to show you something a little weird. As as any little girl who any girl who was a little girl in the '80s or any time can tell you, what do you do with your with your Barbies or your toys? Take off their clothes. Take off their clothes. Okay, so prepare yourself. I don't understand why this is the way it is. <laughs> so apparently. Kenner had a mandate that said, we do not want children imagining Obi-Wan without anything on. But Luke and Han Solo, fine. I, personally, I find the blue briefs to be more upsetting. <laughs> because why is he wearing, like... And, and those are not painted on by a kid. The, every Obi-Wan doll apparently has the blue skivvies, but all the Han and Luke's are just nude. <laughs> That's actually true in the, the Indiana Jones as well, right. like in the, the toy line. Right, although it's unfair. The swordsman in Indiana Jones in the action figure line, if his robe ever comes off, he has black skivvies. But Sala, who's also in a full robe, gets full-on dockers. I don't know why <laughs> that is. All right, who recognizes this guy? Chuckles, right, from G.I. Joe. Did you ever know that, that he was also in a movie? <laughs> yeah, in Casino Royale, um, Daniel Craig in the very beginning is dressed just like Chuckles with the same haircut and everything. It's really weird. And, it, and when I saw the film in the theater, I, I was so distracted. I was like, this is like Chuckles the movie. <laughs> it's so but it's bizarre. so much cooler than like a lot of the stuff that was in the actual G.I. Joe movie. Like he's wearing you could almost imagine it was a G.I. Joe movie. He's wearing the same shirt and pants. It's crazy. All right, so Zodak. Does anyone remember, remember Zodak? No. Yeah. Was he a good guy or a bad guy? We don't know. Yes. <laughs> right. You notice how he has that clawed hand in the action figure? That usually denoted that he was a bad guy because all the bad guys had the clawed hand. Well, on the bad guys, or on the toy line, he was a bad guy. Or chaotic neutral, I guess would be the proper role playing term. Uh, however, in the, in the cartoon, he was a good guy. He was like this sort of silver surfer type that would show up and tell people about the galaxy and the cosmic worlds and then he'd disappear. Like the Traveler from Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, but in the, in the toy line, he was evil. Like he was somebody I don't even think Skeletor wanted to mess with. Oh yeah, Wheeled Warriors. Remember <laughs> Wheeled Warriors? The you, best opening song ever. Yes, rock and theme song. Um, but unfortunately, there was a big disconnect between the toy line and the actual cartoon. 
the guys on the upper left are the figures that came with the uh, vehicles, just a series of nondescript white guys with neckties and jumpsuits. <laughs> um, but in the, toy in, the, in the show, the characters were all like Mad Max. They all had these skunk mullets and they, you know, they had these you know, ponytails and they were all very distinct. And uh, suddenly sales started to slip because kids were watching these shows and not seeing their figures on the shelves. And so they tried to rush prototypes into production and they were too late. And so they never got them out. And so Wheeled Warriors falls into obscurity with everybody else. And another, another toy line that had a mismatch with the cartoon was is Dungeons, Dungeons and Dragons. Dragons. Yeah, the, uh, the Dungeons and Dragons line the cast on the show were the kids from the theme park that got sucked into another world, but if you went to the toy store, it was advanced Dungeons and Dragons dudes with names like Ringle Run and Melf, um, who was the elf. Melf the elf, yeah. Yeah. This, I just had to include this because I never knew that this existed until I was preparing for this panel, and I'm really sad about that because I'm a huge horror film fan and, and a Nightmare on Elm Street fan. And I'm just shocked that they made a talking Freddy Krueger doll <laughs> that says, like, you know, I want to be your friend, or Let, let's be friends, in the Robert Englund voice. Yes, sir. Yes, not only did they make the uh, talking Freddy Krueger doll, which said really some gruesome yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. It didn't say, let's be friends. It I think one of the things that it says is that I was watching. Going to get you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, what is this? Any GoBot fans in the audience? <laughs> Yeah. Robots. All right, this is um, this is Crane Brain. Gobots always had dumb names, and this is Crane Brain, and he was one of my first Gobots, and I always thought he was really cool. And then Joe and I found out uh, a few years ago that Gobots were actually called Machine Robo in Japan. It was a line of, of little toys that were scaled to Hot Wheels and Matchbox. Um, and then we found out that three years after the Hanna-Barbera cartoon <coughs> Gobots came out, the Japanese animated their own completely different show from Machine Robo called Machine Robo. Um, and so we were watching this clip of Machine Robo. And it's, it's these weird human characters that are robo they're robotic, but they reflect nothing that looks like a Gobot. And they're in this city. Uh, this is like the third or fourth episode. And they're wandering around, looking around. And I got really excited, because suddenly I see Crane Brain, and then <laughs> <laughs> Very poorly placed accessory. <laughs> so <laughs> And you thought the Freddy Krueger doll was inappropriate. <laughs> so the, the thing that I have to conclude is that I always knew <laughs> I could never figure out where that accessory was supposed to go when he was a robot, so I would just toss it off to the side. I, such a good I, boy. <laughs> knowledge brings fear. Yeah. Okay? And, yeah. And mental scars. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's not the only toy that was ever really inappropriate either, aside from Freddy Krueger. You had stuff like this, which... <laughs> Yeah. I'm just going to leave that there and you guys do with it what you I'm want. I'm going to let Yeah, let's just let that speak for itself. There are some toys that just don't age well. So there were a lot of toys that almost almost got made but didn't. Galaxy Rangers. Yeah, the the the, the show was uh, very ahead of its time as far as the technology used in the cartoon. They used some initial CGI blended in with the hand-drawn animation, Jerry Orbach was the voice of the main character. Very cool concept, a lot of Firefly fans might like it. Yeah, I was about it. to say, it's yeah, kind of really like, yeah, it it like Firefly in that sense of westerns in space. And the toys were going to get made, but the show mm. just never could find its footing in syndication, and the toys all got shipped off to Europe. So they were sold, but they were only sold in Europe. And the girl, uh, the girl up there, Nico, don't be fooled, that's a prototype that surfaced a few years ago, she was never included in the line. So uh, if you can find these, they're, they're a mint, but uh, they weren't ever sold in the United States. This next one is really upsetting to me because it's one of my favorite movies and it never got toys. <gasps> it almost got toys. But it almost did. So in 1982, um, Jim Henson was working with a company called Aviva um, on a, a line of three and three quarter inch figures, but um, they just didn't get it um, done. They just, it never happened. And so there are these 
there's this Aviva catalog shot that shows all the figures, um, what they would have been. And, um, you know, this is some card backs and stuff like that. So they were really close, but it just never happened. Yeah. <sighs> and the never ending story. So um, these, these toys were actually made, the, they were released in Mexico only. And um, they're, they're super, like, <coughs> not really um, well, well sculpted and yeah. stuff like that. But it is pretty cool. Oh. <laughs> oh. 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 That was, that was <laughs> coming in wave two. <laughs> so that's pretty upsetting. V, anybody a fan of V? They had a, an expanded line that never got made, though. That was the yeah. They LJN was working on this, and they had a, a, a whole giant uh, plan for all these characters. You know, you got your good guys over here, and your invaders over there. Um, they had like faces that could be interchanged with these these the, the evil reptiles and stuff like that, but it just never happened. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> these were this close to getting in stores. And they yeah. were gonna they were by Galoob and they were gonna be two packs. So it was gonna be a good guy and a bad guy on each blister card. And they were gonna do the whole run, they were gonna they were gonna have a gun star, they were gonna have the whole Star Wars style toy line. And unfortunately, <laughs> the merchandisers predicted Last Starfighter would do badly and they held off. And then Last Starfighter did much better than expected at the box office, but they were too late, they'd already canceled their, their plans. And so nothing happened. So <laughs> This is, this is my favorite cartoon ever. Like, it, it was the only cartoon that I really watched as a kid. And um, it, it breaks my heart, but apparently what happened is Mego got the license to, to do Thundar figures, because we're talking, like, late 70s, very early 80s when that show came out. And they were, Mego was approaching the end of its lifespan, so they had to scale back. And so they had to make a decision as to which toy line that they had in production or pre-production that they were actually going to make. So does anyone know what they made instead? I think you're all going to be really sad. I know all, I know all of your brains have just done a backflip. <laughs> We you, feel your pain. You have to understand that the 80s was really big on cocaine. <laughs> and so these executives were probably not in their right mind Obviously. making these decisions. There was yeah. a hot rush on the Isaac toy, though. Everybody wanted the Isaac. Now, obviously, we all know kids love cruise ships. That's right. Yeah. Right. That's right. Well, obviously, these. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thundar did eventually get toys in the 90s. Or no, late, 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 late odds. Early odds, yeah. sorry. But, um, and, and they're pretty cool. I have them. But it's just not really the same as having toys out when the show was out, you know? Oh, yeah, this is the final. Okay, so uh, the long and the short of this is that when we bought Dick Tracy figures for the few of us that did, uh, I was one, uh, we would flip it over on the back and we would see on the back of the card that there was a figure for the blank. Now, when you saw the movie, you know, the blank is Madonna. Spoiler alert. Um, but, uh, <laughs> however, we knew that and didn't really care because as a child you separate the blank from Madonna. The blank is just that cool character in the black <coughs> coat and hat with no face. And I'm like, that's the Boba Fett of the line. I want that. Well, we searched everywhere, everywhere, could not find it. And even though it was on every single card back, it was never in stores. And the reason is, is that Disney told Playmates Toys, the makers of Ninja Turtles, they said, please don't release this toy for the first few months because we don't want to spoil the ending of the film for anybody who hasn't seen it this summer. Well, unfortunately, the toys did not sell well at all. And part of that was due to the movie, and part of that was due to the fact that all the toys looked like Morlocks, these <laughs> deformed mutant guys, because um, Playmates just couldn't get away from their Ninja Turtles designs. Uh, and so the toys were not ordered by the, the toy companies, and that's the wave that would have had the blank in it. So in order to get rid of uh, a few thousand blanks that had actually been produced in anticipation of that order, they sent them all to Canada. <laughs> and uh, most of the card backs that you'll find have French and English on it, you know, Le Blanc, you know, like all that stuff. So, uh, so if you can find a blank uh, on the card, it's going to be probably from Canada. Very few of them are just in English, and they're worth quite a bit of money. Well, we want to thank all of you for coming to the panel. Thank you so much. Yes. I hope it's been fun. Thank you guys. Um, We've got
when you when you go to rate when you go to rate this panel and please do on your app please rate the panel tell everybody you enjoyed it because we'd really love to come back next year and entertain you guys some more so and we've got cards up here if you want any yes, yeah if you'd like to get in touch with us we have cards i got some cards here yes sir thank you very much guys where's your card Yep. You guys were awesome. Thank you very Absolutely much. Absolutely awesome. We appreciate it. So, how often do you find yourself playing? Uh, you know, our houses are pretty much toy museums. And I'm always shuffling out stock, and whenever I put something new in, I've got a transformator. I've got a, you know, it, it gets played with a little bit before it goes on the shelf for display. So, yeah. Thank you. My absolute favorite panel of the weekend. Thank you so much. Glad you loved it. Yeah, we'll rate it for sure. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming.